Hi, I'm Frances Gaines welcoming you as we continue to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Yale women entering Yale College and the 150th anniversary of women first studying at Yale. We are, for the rest of this program this fall, extremely proud to be highlighting outstanding women in science currently at Yale, as well as Yale graduates who have gone on as leaders in their fields elsewhere. I'm certain you'll find them both impressive and inspiring. Please also note your calendars for the next two that follow after today. On October 15th, Julia Clark, now at the University of Texas, will be talking about how do we go beyond bones to bring dinosaurs to life. And on November 12th, Monique Scott, now at Bryn Mawr, will be joining us. Now for today, we are so proud and excited to be hosting Dr. Mary C. Stoddard, otherwise known as Cassie, who is Assistant Professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at Princeton University. Cassie has, during her undergraduate years, conducted research in ornithology collections at the Peabody. She was also a museum tour guide. And she's a research affiliate at the American Museum of Natural History in New York, and of course, the Yale Peabody Museum. She is a 2018 Sloan Research Fellow and a 2018 Packard Fellow. Also, we're so delighted to have Yasmina Viman with us as her partner. Yasmina received both a bachelor's and a master's degree from the University of Bonn in Germany before starting a PhD program here at Yale in 2016. She is developing new molecular methods that probe the geological record of life to reveal its evolutionary history. Yasmina has also published papers about the evolution of egg color, and her work was recently highlighted in the National Geographic feature, Reimagining Dinosaurs, just a couple of weeks ago. We're so pleased to have her as well. Cassie will talk about birds as the most diverse and colorful land vertebrates and the processes that drive this variation. Yasmina, as I mentioned before, will be her program partner and she'll be following Cassie's talk with questions and conversation. Please note that we've disabled the chat function for this webinar, so please use the Q&A function to submit questions. You can submit them at any time during the webinar. We typically receive many more questions than our presenters have time to answer, so we apologize if by some chance we're not able to get to yours. Now, about today. Colorful and diverse birds have evolved over the past 150 million years. That's such a big number. I, I can't even get my mind around how many years that is. Cassie, we're so intrigued with your research today and anxious to hear more. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Francis, for that very kind introduction. I'm going to attempt to share my screen here. Okay, hopefully you can all see my screen and hear me. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm so grateful for that introduction, Francis. Thank you so much. I'm really honored to have been invited to participate in this lecture series, especially because Yale and the Peabody Museum are such an important part of how I became fascinated by the colorful world of birds. Let me start by saying that I feel very fortunate to work with a wonderful group of students and postdocs in my lab at Princeton. And together, we're really interested in understanding how animals became so diverse in terms of their colors, their patterns, their shapes, and their sizes. And when we look at a scene like this one, we ask, how did evolution produce this tremendous diversity? And when exploring this question, my group tends to focus on birds and their eggs. So why birds? Well, as Francis mentioned, birds are really ideal candidates for thinking about the evolution of diversity. First of all, birds are living dinosaurs, having evolved about 150 million years ago. Modern birds are the descendants of theropod dinosaurs. And today, there are over 10,000 different bird species, making them the most diverse terrestrial vertebrates. 
Birds range in size from the ostrich that you see here to the tiny bee hummingbird, and they live on every continent and inhabit a huge range of ecological niches. And of course, they can be extremely colorful. So we've got the red cardinal here, the orange cock of the rock, we have the goldfinch, we have this glistening green tanager, that's actually its name, the glistening green tanager, the indigo bunting, the blue jay, and the violet-backed starling. But my favorite bird of all is this bird. This is the painted bunting. It's one of the most colorful birds that you can see in the United States. And I grew up watching birds with my family. I often looked for painted buntings in Florida where my grandmother lived. And I remember thinking the first time I saw this bird just how striking its green back was. But it really wasn't until I got to Yale as a freshman that I realized there was more than meets the eye. I was really lucky in my freshman year to be admitted to this seminar taught by Leo Buss called the Collections of the Peabody Museum. And in this course, I was able to conduct my own research in the collections of the Peabody. My first project was with Larry Gall, and we studied these remarkable dinandromorph butterflies. My second project was in the Peabody's ornithology collections, and I worked with Christoph Siskowski and Rick Prum. And with Rick, I started working on the evolution of plumage color in the New World buntings, which is a colorful group of birds that includes the painted bunting, which you can see here. And as a part of this project, I used a device called a spectrophotometer, and I was able to measure this green back of the painted bunting. And I realized that the back feathers were actually UV green. So we humans can detect light between 400 and 700 nanometers. That's roughly from blue to red. But birds can see all of these colors plus ultraviolet in the three to 400 nanometer range. So this green back of the painted bunting probably appears very different to other birds than it does to us. When I was an undergraduate at this time, there was a growing appreciation for the, the idea that birds, like many animals, see the world in terms of color very differently than humans do. Birds, for example, are tetrachromatic. That means they have four color cone types in their retinas. These cones are sensitive to ultraviolet, blue, green, and red light, respectively. But by contrast, most mammals are dichromatic with just two cone types in their retinas, sensitive to short and long wavelengths. We humans are trichromatic. We have three color cone types. Those are our blue, green, and red cone types. And then bees are also trichromats, but instead of having a red sensitive cone type, they have a UV sensitive cone type. To try to understand how a painted bunting's blue crown and its UV green back might be seen by birds, Rick and I developed tools for analyzing bird color in a tetrachromatic color space, in which each vertex represents one of the bird's four color cone types. In doing this, we were really inspired by discussions we were having with another Yale professor, Tim Goldsmith, who spent many decades investigating color vision in birds. So working in the Peabody collections really opened my eyes to the fact that birds appear even more colorful to each other than they do to us. And now we can measure this with sophisticated technology. So I just wanted to show you a photo of two museum parrots that I took with a special UV sensitive camera. This is the first image. This is just a normal human viz image. But here's the UV image, and these bright white patches in the UV image show us that there's actually a lot of UV color on these birds. We just can't see it with our own eyes. So where these birds are glowing white, they're actually reflecting a substantial amount of UV. And this really matters because birds are using their colorful feathers for many functions, from mate choice and social signaling to camouflage. And to really appreciate bird evolution and behavior, we have to account for the fact that they have a sophisticated tetrachromatic color vision system that is different from our own. 
And it's not just these bird feathers that are strikingly colorful. When we look at bird eggs, we see that they also come in such a variety of colors, patterns, shapes, and sizes. And sometimes we find with eggs that color is used not for communication, but for deception, as we will see. So I'd like to tell you two short stories about our efforts to understand the colorful world of birds. We'll start by taking a virtual field trip to the Rockies for a glimpse into the lives of hummingbirds, and then we'll go to the reed beds of England to peek into the secret world of cuckoos. This is a broad-tailed hummingbird. This is the hero of our first story. We've been studying these hummingbirds at the Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory in Gothic, Colorado. And the question that we're really asking is this, what does it mean to be tetrachromatic? Color vision we know has to do with the way that these different color cones combine and interact. So it's not just that birds can see all of the colors humans can see plus a little bit of UV tacked on. In theory, they can see different combination colors like UV red and UV green. And we think this should give birds an extra dimension of color perception. We currently assume that tetrachromatic birds can see all of the colors represented in a tetrahedral color space. But is that really true? This idea that birds can see all of these colors like UV red and UV green, this is a fundamental assumption of the color vision models that we use to understand color in birds and many other tetrachromats. But this assumption hinges on the idea that birds can perceive non-spectral colors, which are not in the rainbow. And this idea hasn't been tested systematically. So what are non-spectral colors? Non-spectral colors are not in the rainbow. These are colors that would stimulate pairs of cones that are sensitive to widely separated parts of the spectrum. So UV green, for example, is a non-spectral color. For a bird, UV green would stimulate the UV cone and the green cone, but not the blue cone and the red cone. Similarly, UV red is a non-spectral color that would stimulate the UV cone and the red cone. Purple is another type of non-spectral color that would stimulate a bird's blue and red cones. We humans have only one major type of non-spectral color and that's purple. That's when our red cones and our blue cones are simultaneously stimulated. But because birds have four color cones compared to our three, they have the opportunity to see potentially many more different types of non-spectral colors, such as UV green and UV red. And surprisingly, even though we know that birds can detect UV and we believe that they have the four color cone types, we don't know much about their perception of these non-spectral colors, like the UV green back that we observed in the painted bunting. And that is precisely what we went to go explore with these hummingbirds. With my collaborators, I've been training a population of wild hummingbirds to participate in color vision tests. And I say training here very loosely because actually the birds require very little training. They will visit feeders readily. So these hummingbirds are wonderful, energetic test subjects for the study of color vision. At our field site, which you see here, we hang up feeders to attract the birds, and eventually we take those feeders down and we replace them with our experimental setup. We design these special bird vision LED light tubes, the tetracolor tubes, which allow us to create a whole range of bird visible colors like UV green and UV red. And we've been performing experiments that work like this. So in our experiments, one color is rewarded with sugar water, the other has just water. After set time, we swap the positions of our setups so the birds can't simply use spatial cues to select the rewarded color. We then record whether the birds choose the correct rewarded color the first time they visit the experiment, which they do repeatedly over the course of the day. And after several hours, we're able to detect whether the population has learned to discriminate the colors or not. In this case, the birds can easily discriminate red from green when red is the rewarded color, and they can do very well in the same experiment when green is rewarded instead. 
And we also perform control experiments, which show that the birds can't distinguish identical colors, which might be the case if they're just copying each other or if they're using olfactory cues. So we do think that color is really the key variable of interest here. Okay, so I've just shown some very simple experiments like red versus green, but we've conducted a whole series of harder experiments. And overall, the birds revealed to us that they are able to distinguish between pairs of non-spectral colors that fall throughout this tetrahedral color space. And that's exciting because it really does suggest that hummingbirds do see a huge range of combination non-spectral colors that we humans see very differently. And this is probably true of many other birds beyond, beyond hummingbirds. So that UV green color that I measured all those years ago as a freshman at Yale, birds see that color as something that's truly different from just green, truly different from just UV. It is a color that is beyond our own imagination. And we also showed that these colors are prevalent in the natural environments of birds. So here are three reflectance spectra showing UV red, UV green, and purple colors that exist in plants and in plumage. So hummingbirds have excellent color vision, but how are they using color in their daily lives? How are they using it in courtship and in foraging? Most broad-tailed males will perform these spectacular courtship dives in which they fly about 30 meters in the air and then they plunge over the ground, flying just over the head of a female and then back up again. And they do this repeatedly. And if you've ever seen it, it's, it's really a sight to behold. At the very bottom of the dive, the birds will snap their tail feathers together to create a loud buzz and they also show off their iridescent throats. We know from work by other researchers that this loud buzz is produced by the tail feathers. So my postdoc Ben Hogan and I wanted to know how does color interact with motion and speed and sound in this dive display? How does the female perceive these aspects of the dive and how synchronized are these different elements? And we were really excited to think about iridescent color in these displays because the males have this very striking iridescent throat patch, which changes in appearance dramatically as a function from angle, going from black from one view to deep reddish magenta in another. So in the field, we recorded videos of dives and we used tracking software to track the path of the male dives. Here's a male that performed two of these sequential dives. And then back in the lab, we analyzed the speed and the sound and the color of these dives. So here's a simulation of one male's dive and it shows that this male delivered a sensory explosion right at the base of the dive. So here the female will have perceived the color as shifting from red to black. Uh, the male will have made a tail generated buzz and he will have reached his top speed. And when we analyzed all the dives together, we found that this is actually a general feature of these dives. Males tend to reach the top speed at almost exactly the same time that they're snapping their tail feathers and showing off their iridescent throat feathers. So in other words, all of this action is concentrated to a 300 millisecond window. Uh, that's a blink of an eye. It is a very tight window. So it shows that these dive components are highly synchronized. So we found that these males are using color as part of a highly choreographed display uh, to woo, woo females. That kind of covers the courtship side. But next we wanted to know how might these birds be using color to find flowers? At our field site in the summer, every week brings this new wave of wildflowers. And surprisingly, we don't have very good data on the frequency with which these hummingbirds are visiting the different floral species. And to understand how hummingbirds might be using color and paying attention to color with respect to flowers, first we have to figure out which flowers they are visiting. And this is also important in terms of climate change because at our field site, many of these flowers are blooming much earlier than they used to even 40 years ago. And that could cause problems for the hummingbirds if they don't adjust their behavior. 
So to try to figure out which flowers these birds visit, my research team has been setting up time-lapse cameras at flowers to catch hummingbirds in the act of foraging. So here are a few of these hummingbird foraging events that we've captured uh, on film. And so far we have over 30,000 hours of footage. We call them flower hours. And we're using machine learning algorithms to help us analyze these images. Ultimately, we hope that this will give us a detailed picture of hummingbird foraging behavior so we can start to understand how they're using color to guide their decisions about which flowers to visit. Okay, I'm gonna switch gears now from flashy feathers to counterfeit eggs. We're going to go on a very short trip to the reed beds of England where we find this bird. This is the common cuckoo. This is a notorious brood parasite that breeds across Europe and Asia. These birds do not build their own nests. They do not raise their own young. Instead, they sneak their eggs into the nests of unrelated birds. And I started studying these birds and their remarkable eggs when I was a PhD student in England. Here's a photo of a reed warbler nest. It contains three reed warbler eggs and a cuckoo egg. The cuckoo egg is this larger egg at the front. Now, if the cuckoo egg goes undetected by the reed warbler host, the cuckoo chick will hatch and it will throw the reed warbler's eggs out of the nest like this. The cuckoo chick then grows into this monster baby that you see here, and it is now being fed by a reed warbler adult. So how does the cuckoo get away with this trickery? Well, cuckoo females have evolved egg mimicry. That means that they can often match the egg appearance of their preferred host species. And they really have to do this because many of the host species have evolved the ability to detect and then reject odd parasitic eggs. But how good is this egg mimicry from a bird's eye view? My colleagues and I measured hundreds of eggs at the Natural History Museum in Tring in England. And we focused here on the cuckoo and its favorite European hosts. We carefully measured the colors and patterns of cuckoo and host eggs, and we see that the lack of color and pattern mimicry is very striking in some of these cuckoo host pairs. The cuckoos that parasitize the reed warblers do a better job of matching the color and pattern of host eggs. And here we see that the cuckoos that target bramblings do a really good job of matching the color and the pattern of host eggs. So overall, using a bird's eye view, we found that cuckoos lay better matching eggs where the host is more discriminating. So for example, the cuckoo has pretty bad mimicry where hosts still show very low levels of rejection defenses like the duck. But cuckoos have evolved excellent egg mimicry like in the brambling and the shrike here where hosts show strong defenses. So our study really supports the idea that because many hosts have evolved the ability to reject odd eggs, cuckoos have evolved egg mimicry, sometimes spectacularly so. But is it possible that host birds over evolutionary time have been fighting back by evolving more recognizable egg patterns on their own eggs, sort of like a special signature or a watermark that makes it easier for hosts to figure out which eggs are their own versus which might belong to a cuckoo. To test this, we developed a face recognition for eggs uh, tool. It's called Nature Pattern Match. and allowed us to analyze very specific features on bird eggs. We found that the hosts that have been the most intensely targeted by cuckoos have indeed evolved the most distinctive, recognizable eggs. And we were really excited about this because it suggests that cuckoos and hosts have escalated this co-evolutionary battle to a new stage of the arms race. This is really an evolutionary war that's being waged in color and in pattern at the egg stage. Beyond egg color and pattern, my colleagues and I are also interested in the evolution of egg shape. 
And in one study, we analyzed the egg shapes of about 1,400 species, and we observed that bird eggs come in a tremendous variety of shapes. You can see some of those here. And we've also been thinking about egg structure by taking a close look at the emu. Emus lay these stunning, deep green eggs. They have a rough surface texture. And we've been taking a close look at the eggshell ultrastructure, and I'll just end by showing you this really close up view of an emu eggshell as it appears under the microscope. And you can see the inside of the shell all the way to the outside of the shell here. And where you see the blue color, that's where the pigment is seeping through the shell. So just to recap, Birds are using color and pattern for communication in terms of their flashy dives, for foraging, in terms of finding food in flowers, and for deception sometimes in the case of cuckoo eggs. And to really get a, a view of what these birds are doing, we have to appreciate the bird's sensory experience. So after all of these years, I'm still, uh, you know, totally hooked on bird color. And I think that's because it does provide a wonderful lens through which to examine evolution, evolutionary processes, and the diversity that we observe in nature. And really this all started at the Peabody. So I just wanna end by thanking the Peabody Museum for providing such a dynamic and exciting community for me when I was an undergrad, for continuing to provide that community for current undergrads, uh, those early experiences that I had made a world of difference. And thank you so much to my many colleagues and collaborators, and of course, uh, to all of you for tuning in and uh, to Yasmina um, for agreeing to be my interviewer. So thank you so much. Hey, Cassie, thank you for this talk. This is absolutely exciting work, um, especially from the perspective of a paleontologist. When we're working with fossils, there's usually so much less information available. And when we compare this to living animals, where we can actually observe all these kinds of ecosystem interactions, I have to admit, I'm a little bit jealous. So, I mean, when we look at fossils and we try to reconstruct colors and patterns, let's say in dinosaur eggs um, and like reconstructed um, associated behaviors, most of our inferences are completely guided by research in modern ornithology. And so this is really, really important, you know, for us to get a good idea of what happened in the past. So on that note, maybe um, I'll start with my very first question. Um, your research on color evolution started here during your undergraduate time in Yale UNIB with Rick Prom, as you mentioned. Were you always interested in color and nature? Yeah, I, I was. Um, my grandmothers and my mom got me interested in birding uh, when I was a kid. And you know, when you're looking at birds, you're paying attention to color, you're paying attention to pattern. That's what you first learn to do. And I think um, that comes naturally to us as humans because we humans are really uh, visual creatures. And I think that's why animal coloration has had such a, a rich history I mean, people going back hundreds even thousands of years were writing about animal color i think that's also why it came as such a shock um, that many animals are perceiving color very differently than we are so for a very very long time we were assuming that um, that animals were seeing the same colors that we do and 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 that's a that's a misplaced assumption um, so i think i think um yeah color can be a wonderful a wonderful guide to understanding evolution and understanding nature but we have to try our best to kind of shed our human goggles i think that's a really exciting perspective so you have published some of the most fundamental work on how colorful or color, colorful and how colorful bird eggs can actually be and so i mean looking at your tetrahedral color space i'd be curious what are the extremes in terms of avian egg color and do you think that this color space could potentially change with the discovery of new pigments yeah that's a really uh that's a really great question um i think some of the most extreme bird egg colors are the eggs laid by tinamous. So tinamous are fairly drab looking birds that live in Central and South America, but they lay the most amazing eggs. These come in shiny kind of porcelain-like 
purples and greens and browns and blues. And there was a really interesting study that came out just this year identifying two new pigments in the eggs of tinamous. And before that, we thought that there were just two pigments in all of bird eggs. So now the fact that there are these two new pigments that have been discovered in tinamou eggshells is really changing our worldview on how egg colors have evolved. So I would venture to guess that there are many more pigments out there to discover, and I'm very excited to see uh, what the next five, 10 years will bring in terms of finding, finding those new pigments. And, and as you say, kind of pushing the limits of the color space. So maybe like staying on the topic of pigments, like we have mapped this brown pigment called protoporphyrin over the surface of dinosaur eggshells. And we found that many of them have spots and speckles. And I think your work on brood parasites is super exciting. So now looking at my speckled dinosaur eggs, I'm thinking, wow, you know, like maybe that has something to do with the need for individual egg recognition. And generally, like are egg patterns used for recognition in other contexts at all? Yeah, so we definitely, you know, have seen in the in the brood parasite host realm that egg patterns can be used for recognition, but it is an important question that we are asking in what other contexts and systems and species might you see eggs evolving to enhance recognition and one system um, in which this may occur are, are seabirds, these colonies of densely packed seabirds. So um, for those birders out there, I'm thinking about the murres, the guillemots, the razorbills, the dovekeys. These are birds that tend to nest really crowded rocky ledges. And it might be confusing for parents uh, to find their own egg. Usually one leg, egg is laid. And in some of these MERS species, there's really a remarkable variety, even within a population, of the egg colors and patterns. And so one hypothesis is that when species are nesting very, very densely, their eggs will have evolved to enhance this, uh, this recognizability, so this diversity in colors and patterns. And that's actually something that I've been exploring with some members of my own lab. And our evidence so far suggests that there is a correlation between the species that are more densely packed and those that seem to be laying the eggs that are the most uh, different in terms of their egg color and pattern. And that's just, that's just one area. I'm sure there are many other contexts in which egg recognition is important. Um, but equally, there are, there are examples uh, that we know of where birds don't know their own egg patterns and they can be easily duped. And that's probably because there hasn't been strong selection pressure to, um, to, uh, to evolve that ability. If there's not a lot of uh, misplaced eggs or brood parasitism, then typically we don't expect that behavior to evolve. But it's, it's an area that is um, it's sort of a hot topic and, and deserves more attention. I absolutely agree. So if I would give you a dinosaur egg with like all the color patterns preserved, could you run your nature pattern match software and tell me whether there is brood parasitism going on? Oh my gosh. I mean, Yasmina, you tell me. That would be, um, that would be so cool. I, I think the potential to apply some of these techniques to fossils is certainly there. Um, the techniques may need to be modified, but I've been so excited by the work that you and your colleagues have been doing to show that many dinosaurs appear to have laid colorful eggs. And this is really mind blowing because this suggests that the origin of egg color predated birds and is really changing the way we think about some of these dinosaur behaviors. So, I mean, I'm not sure this is allowed for me to ask you a question, but I'll do it anyway. Do you think that there were brood parasitic dinosaurs? Do you think that behavior may have existed in some of the dinosaurs? I mean, I wouldn't be surprised at all if we look at how certain traits that we generally thought of as avian traits evolved. We see that many of them actually predated modern birds and evolved in their theropod ancestors, maybe even more basal in their archosaur ancestors. So yeah, I think that would be a topic totally worth exploring. We find the occasional dinosaur clutch where there is an egg included that shouldn't be there, laid by a different species. So um, yeah, I generally think that brood parasitism is a very fascinating topic and that's probably also predating modern birds as a clade. Right. So moving on with the next question, there's so much exciting stuff going on. Um, in 2017, your research 
on uh, egg shape evolution made the cover in Science Magazine and arguably one of the most beautiful journal magazine covers of all times. We've seen the slide, I think, in your presentation, maybe you guys remember, the slide with all the different colorful bird eggs assembled. So you've analyzed an incredible amount of eggs for that study. Um, like I think something like 1,400 species of birds represented by even more eggs. How did you manage to like efficiently process so many samples? And what did you discover about the evolution of egg shape? Yeah, well, I mean, I'll say we were extremely fortunate to be able to take advantage of this amazing digitized data set of eggs at Berkeley. That's at the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology. And without that, we never would have been able to do this study. So um, these museum egg collections are just invaluable. And so what we were able to do using these images we designed a um, computer tool called the egg extractor and this egg extractor tool extracts eggs from the images and then analyzes their shapes and so we were able to do that for about 50,000 eggs representing 1400 species and when we plotted the, the map of, of egg shape, we saw that there was a lot of variation in egg shape from spherical owl eggs to kind of elliptical tic-tac-like eggs for hummingbirds to some really asymmetric pointy eggs for seabirds. And, and so we thought, okay, well, what, you know, what is driving this variation? What's responsible for this variation? And we tried to think of this both in a mechanistic way and an evolutionary way. So in terms of the mechanism, my colleagues and I worked on a simple model that might be able to explain the egg shaping process in the oviduct, which is this tube uh, in the bird that is the site of egg formation. And we hypothesized that it's actually the stretchy membrane of the egg and not the shell that's really playing a critical role in, in the egg shape process. And then we looked at it from the evolutionary perspective and we collected a lot of data about the diet, the body size, the body type, the clutch size, the nest locations of these different bird species. And we found a correlation between flight behavior and egg shape. We found that birds that tend to be strong flyers tend to lay eggs that are pointier and more elongated. And we think that may be because there are adaptations associated with the, the flight bodies or the body plan uh, associated with shape that are influencing what's happening in the oviduct, in and around the oviduct, um, in a way that does have an effect on egg shape. And so we, you know, we still feel like there's so many questions to address about egg shape, but here uh, some technology combined with this wonderful data set at the museum made it possible for us to sort of take a first pass. Yeah, it's really big picture science. It's super impressing. So talking about fantastic flyers, hummingbirds are the acrobats of air. So generally, you've been working on hummingbirds and hummingbird color perception and hummingbird color signaling. It is mind blowing to me that hummingbirds are sort of like included within a clade of birds that's ancestrally nocturnal. So active during nighttime, how does that work? Yeah, I mean, you said it. I think the hummingbirds are particularly fascinating because they, with their close relatives, which are the swifts, form a group nested in this historically nocturnal lineage that includes really cryptic birds like nightjars and nighthawks. So, you, you know, you think about, you get this uh, sort of, as you say, acrobatic, vibrant, charismatic, diurnal, pollinating group of birds springing out of an, an ancestrally nocturnal group. And I think one of the big questions we have is, has that nocturnal history had an impact on the color vision of hummingbirds? What changes may have occurred um, throughout evolutionary time that could affect how hummingbirds are seeing colors? And so these are questions that my colleagues and I are exploring. I think, uh, you know, Hummingbirds are a, a very diverse group. There's over 300 species of, of hummingbirds. And so ultimately what we'd like to do is, is expand beyond just the, the broad-tailed hummingbird we've been working on and see the extent to which some of these results we're finding with broad-tails extend to these other, other hummingbird groups. So that's, that's something we definitely hope to do moving forward. 
birds are just fascinating. <laughs> Um, we've, we've talked about the past, we've talked about the present, so now looking into the future, what are the most promising and exciting innovations in understanding the ecology and evolution of color signaling? Wow, yeah, I mean, gosh, where do you start? I think the, I think there, there's so much new technology that is, you know, literally allowing us to see more than we ever saw before. Uh, cameras are getting, uh, better, faster, cheaper, and they're allowing us to capture in sophisticated ways the colors that exist on, on bird feathers or in flowers. And that combined with computational tools provides us with a, a better way of simulating these experiences that of course we humans cannot have, but we can measure and we can appreciate. And so I think, you know, one thing I'm really excited about is just how technology and big data um, will, will contribute to some of the insights that have been building over the past decades on animal coloration. Uh, with our hummingbird um, flower project, we're finding that with these time-lapse cameras combined with machine learning algorithms that are actively being developed by ecologists and evolutionary biologists in our field, we're able to learn quickly with thousands of hours uh, what these birds are actually doing. And that just wasn't possible even five years ago. I think the other thing that I'm really excited about is uh, sort of where the field is with genetics and genomics. I think we're going to be able to learn so much about the genetic and genomic mechanisms that support color vision in birds and other animals. And we'll be able to do this in a way that goes beyond some of the model species that have you know, become the, the best studied organisms. Now we can start to take advantage of the diversity that we see in these groups to learn more about the, the genetic and genomic evolutionary history. So I think those things together uh, provide a lot to look forward to as we, as we continue. Yeah, it's like a really exciting moment to be working on color evolution and anything associated with it. So maybe something on a more personal level. When I was an undergrad student and I had to pick my bachelor research topic, I chose to work on color evolution, dinosaur egg color evolution. And, you know, back then I read through the literature and I got really inspired by some of your early work on color evolution, as probably many others did. You've had like an absolutely remarkable career so far. What is your advice in like the context of our uh, 50 women at Yale 150 scheme? What is your advice for like a young woman um, thinking generally as a young person considering a future career in evolutionary biology? Well, I think, you know, I think maybe the, the, the most important thing would be to pay attention to nature. I think that um, I, I've been thinking a lot about this in the context of the, the undergraduates that I teach and, and particularly as we're, we're remote this semester, we're trying to get out in nature and observe more than more than we might normally it's um it's a great time to be becoming a, a sort of natural historian and and part of that is that there is technology to help us the apps out there for identifying plants and identifying birds and identifying mushrooms these apps now mean that anybody with a phone can go out and start to learn about what they observe in the natural world and so i think paying attention to nature, asking questions, following your curiosity, um, you know, following your passion where it leads is, is advice I would give, give to anyone. Um, I also think, you know, something that helped, helped me when I, was, uh, when I was an undergrad and I think is, is even more essential now is learning to write computer code. Um, I think that this is just becoming something that's a huge part of, of our field and that's a big shift in the last 10 years. And so it's never too soon to start writing code. There are wonderful resources online and no matter what you do, this is a, this is a tool that I think will serve you well. So, you know, go outside and write computer code. I think those are two, two pieces of advice I would, I would give to anyone. I'll totally take that one. So I think at this point we can move on to questions from the audience and I see that we got a couple of really interesting questions. So let me start here on the top. I'm just reading that to you, so um, let's get started. Do bird eggs exhibit UV colors and patterns in addition to the colors we humans can see? which might help the parent birds distinguish between their own eggs and the cuckoo's eggs. 
Yeah, thank you for that. That's a really interesting question and one we've wondered about. It would be uh, amazing if we saw these sort of secret UV patterns that show up under UV light on, on bird eggs. So we do see that bird eggs, some bird eggs do reflect some UV light. So a lot of these colorful eggs have a UV component. We haven't yet seen a pattern, meaning like a spot pattern that exclusively exists in the UV. Um, never say never, it may be out there, and we certainly haven't imaged all of the eggs using UV cameras that would allow us to determine that, but in the cuckoo and host eggs that I looked at as part of the common cuckoo study, we did not see that. Um, nevertheless, the UV is an important part of how these eggs are being evaluated, which is why when we did that project, we used a UV sensitive camera, we measured pattern and color in a way that accounted for this ability. As a side note, uh, there have been animals that, that have been discovered that do show patterns that appear exclusively in the UV. This has been shown in some fish faces, for example, um, until researchers looked at these fish with UV light and UV cameras, they didn't know that they had elaborate patterns on their faces that reflect in the UV and may be used for signaling and communications. So I think that there's still a lot to learn with respect to that. And all I can say is we will, we will keep looking. So we're going to the next question that would be, uh, where is the ruby-throated hummingbird that visited my CT bee balm in July into in July into August now, are hummingbirds adjusting migration schedules to warming temperatures? And how does color play a role in migration? Yes, well, I have been thinking about ruby-throated hummingbirds a lot because I have been here in Princeton on the East Coast, enjoying very much seeing ruby-throated hummingbirds passing through. Um, I think that this question of how migration behavior is influenced um, both by the conditions, environmental conditions we're observing now, the effects of climate change on migration, these are active areas of study. Uh, I can't tell you exactly where your hummingbird is. I, I hope that it is okay. I mean, these hummingbirds, these ruby-throated hummingbirds that migrate, they do an incredible thing as they you know, fly south. Some of them then migrate all the way across the Gulf of Mexico. And the, um, the timing of this has been studied by some researchers. The question of color and its role in migration is also a timely one. I think um, with our broad-tailed hummingbirds, something that we have observed just in the past few years is that the flowers that the hummingbirds are used to seeing are yellow when they arrive on their breeding ground. These are yellow flowers called the glacier lily, and they're called that because they're the first ones to kind of pop above the snow. And a, a Two years ago, we had in a very extreme field season where it was much, much warmer than usual. And so that meant that these glacial lilies were blooming at a time that was out of sync with when the hummingbirds arrived. And so we wondered how is this influencing their sensory landscape? Might that send them a signal about migration that is not helpful. How robust will hummingbirds be as climate change impacts the colorful flowers um, that, that bloom and, and the timing of that bloom? So we're hoping that with this flower project, we're able to map out this sensory landscape in a way that may help us give some insight to the migration influence um, and how color put, plays into that. So it's a great question. It's, it's something we've been thinking a lot about. So we have one last question here. Um, I noticed a small note at the bottom of one of your slides, which mentioned oil droplets in the bird retinas. How do the droplets function in the visual world of birds? Oh, thank you very much for asking that question and for noticing that. Oil droplets exist in the color cones of the birds themselves, and they play an extremely important role. These oil droplets actually filter out some of the wavelengths of light, which provides the birds with even more refined color discrimination. In other words, when we show those curves, the sensitivity curves, the four sensitivity curves for the bird eyes, they show fairly minimal overlap. And that is because the oil droplets are minimizing 
the extent to which those, those cones will be sensitive to neighboring wavelengths. So the oil droplets seem to be very important for providing birds with enhanced color discrimination. This is also something that researchers are studying actively. How much diversity is there in oil droplets? Do all birds have oil droplets? Do the oil droplets depend on diet? They're uh, carotenoid based. And so these are all things that may influence the way birds perceive their colorful world. And it's one part of the physiological story to color vision that has received a, a lot of attention, but more and more is coming out every year, specifically on oil droplets. And it is changing the way we model these perceptual experiences. Thank you, Cassie and Esmina. What a fascinating talk. I really, like you said, have to go out there and pay a whole lot more attention to what's going on around me. I think truly a remarkable program by two remarkable Yale women. So very much appreciated by everyone. Um, please to our audience, thank you also for attending. Please mark your calendars for coming on October 15th when Julia Clark comes to talk about Beyond Bones, what do we do to about bring dinosaurs to life? and when Monique Scott from Bryn Mawr joins us. And lastly, to our wonderful audience, please follow us on social media or sign up for our mailing list through the connect box on our homepage. We want to be sure that you know about all our other upcoming online programs. And again, thanks once again to you wonderful women. Remarkable for sure. And we're so proud and happy to have you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Francis. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Yasmina. It's, um, it's been a real pleasure and an honor. Thank you very much. Same here. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Bye.